Hello friends, we are back. One and only Ivan. Episode eight, we are reading starting on page 111. In the last section, we got some bad news about Stella not doing very well. And Julia is very concerned and is trying to get some attention um, for Mac to bring a vet in to see Stella. This chapter is called The Promise. <clears throat> My domain gleams with moonlight when I awake to the, the sound of Stella's calls. Ivan, Stella says in a hoarse whisper, Ivan, I'm here, Stella. I sit up abruptly. Abruptly means kind of immediately. And Bob topples off my stomach. I run to the window. I can see Ruby next to Stella, sleeping soundly. Ivan, I want you to promise me something, Stella says. Anything, I say. I've never asked for a promise before because promises are forever and Forever is an unusually long time, especially when you're in a cage. Domain, I correct. Domain, she agrees. I straighten to my full height. I promise, Stella, I say in a voice like my father's. But you haven't even heard what I'm asking yet, she says, and she closes her eyes for a minute. Her great chest shudders. That means kind of shakes. I promise anyway. Stella doesn't say anything for a long time. Never mind, she finally says. I don't know what I was thinking. This pain is making me feel addled. Addled means kind of confused. Ruby stirs. Her trunk moves as if she's reaching for something that isn't there. When I say the words, they surprise me. You want me to take care of Ruby? Stella nods, a small gesture that makes her wince. Wincing is kind of an expression that looks like this, like, like when you're hurting or you're in pain, you might wince. If she could have a life that's different from mine, she needs a safe place, Ivan, not, not here, I say. It would be easier to promise to stop eating or to stop breathing, to stop being a gorilla. I promise, Stella, I say. I promise it on my word as a silverback. Knowing. Before Mac, before Bob, even before Ruby, I know Stella's gone. I know it the way you know that summer is over and winter is on its way. I just, I just know. Stella once teased me that elephants are superior, that means better than, because they feel more joy and more grief than apes. Your gorilla hearts are made of ice, Ivan, she said, her eyes glittering. Ours are made of fire. I wonder what she means by that. Right now, I would give you all the raisins, yogurt raisins in all of the world for a heart made of ice. A heart made of ice probably wouldn't feel sad, right? I think he wants a heart made of ice because he's feeling so sad about Stella passing. That's the inference I'm making. I'm wondering if you made your own inference. Five men. Bob heard from a rat, a reliable sort, that they tossed Stella's body into a garbage truck. It took five men and a forklift. Comfort. All day I try to comfort Ruby, but what can I say? That Stella had a good happy life? that she lived as she was meant to live, that she died with those who loved her most nearby? Well, at least the last one is true. Crying. Julia cries all evening while her father sweeps and mops and dusts and cleans the toilets. When George sees Mac, he runs to him. 
I can only hear a few of his words. Vet, should have, wrong. Max shrugs. He drops his, his shoulders droop. His shoulders droop and he leaves without a word. When George wipes the fingerprints off my glass, his cheeks are wet. He doesn't meet my eyes. What do we find out about George and Mac in that little section? What do we think is different about George and Mac and how they handle the situation? Here's another show don't tell. His cheeks are wet. He doesn't meet my eyes. Have you ever had that feeling of being sad or upset and not wanting to make eye contact? So Catherine Applegate's really showing us how George is feeling without telling us. This chapter is called The One and Only Ivan. When all the humans have left, I send Bob to check on Ruby. How is she? I ask when he returns. She was shivering, Bob says. I tried to cover her with hay and I told her not to worry because you were going to save her. I glare at him. You told her that? You promised Stella. Bob lowered his head. I wanted to make the kid feel better. I shouldn't have made that promise, Bob. I just wanted... I point to Stella's domain and for a moment, it seems I've forgotten how to breathe. I wanted to make Stella happy, but I guess I can't save Ruby. I can't even save myself. I flop onto my back. The cement is always cold, but tonight it hurts. Bob leaps onto my belly. You're the one and only Ivan, he says, mighty silverback. He licks my chin and he's not even checking for leftovers. Say it, Bob, commands. I look away. Say it, Ivan. I don't answer. Bob licks my nose until I can't stand it any longer. I am the one and only Ivan, I mutter. And don't you ever forget it, he says. When I gaze at the food court skylight, the moon Stella loved is shrouded in clouds. Shrouded means kind of encased or enclosed. This chapter is called Once Upon a Time. All night, Ruby moans and sniffles. I pace my domain. I don't want to fall asleep in case she needs something. Ivan, Bob says gently, get some sleep, please for your sake and for mine. Bob can't sleep unless he's on my stomach. I hear a stirring. Ivan, Ruby calls. I rush to my window. Ruby, are you all right? I miss Aunt Stella, Ruby sobs. And I miss my mom and my sisters and my aunts and my cousins too. I know, I say, because that's all I can think to say. Ruby sniffles. I can't sleep. Do you know any stories the way Aunt Stella did? Not really, I admit. Stories were Stella's specialty. Tell me a story about when you were little, Ruby pleads. She puts her trunk between the bars, please, Ivan. I scratched the back of my head. I don't remember things, Ruby, I admit. It's true, Bob says, trying to be helpful. Ivan has a terrible memory. He's the opposite of an elephant. Ruby lets out a long, shivery breath. Oh, well, that's okay. Night, Ivan and Bob. I listen to Ruby's soft sobs for a long, horrible time. And then I hear myself saying, once upon a time, there was a gorilla named Ivan. And slowly and deliberately, I try to remember. Deliberately means that you do something on purpose. The grunt. I was born in a place humans call Central Africa in a dense rainforest so beautiful no crayons could ever do it justice. 
Gorillas don't name their newborns right away the way humans do. We get to know our babies first. We wait to see hints of what might yet be. When they saw how much she loved to chase me around the forest, my parents decided my, on my twin sister's name, Tag. Oh, how I loved to play tag with my sister. She was nimble, but when I got too close, she would leap on my unsuspecting father. Then I would join her and we would bounce off that tolerant belly until he gave us the grunt, the rooting pig sound that meant enough. I'm sure that you know that your parents probably have that word, right? When they're just, they've had enough and they're frustrated. That game never got old, although my father might have disagreed. This chapter's called Mud. It didn't take long for my parents to find my name. All day long, every day, I made pictures. I drew on rocks and bark with my poor mother's back. I used the sap from leaves. I used the juice from fruit, but mostly I used mud. And that's what they called me, mud. To a human, mud might not sound like much, but to me, it was everything. Protector. My family, which humans call a troop, was just like any other gorilla family. There were 10 of us, my father, the silverback, my mother, and three other adult females, a juvenile male called blackback, and two other gorillas, Tag and I were the babies of the group. We squabbled now and then. You know what squabbling means, right? Like fussing at your brother or sister, kind of like a little argument that's not too serious, as families will. But my father knew how to keep us in line with a simple scowl. And for the most part, we were happy to do what we were meant to do, to feed and forage and nap and play. Forage means to look for what you need, specifically food. My father's was a master at leading us to the ripest fruit for our morning feast and the finest branches for our night nests. He was everything a silverback was meant to be, a guide, a teacher, a protector, and nobody could beat his chest like my father. I'm gonna read one more chapter called A Perfect Life. Gorilla babies and elephant babies and human babies are not so different, except that a gorilla gets to spend the day riding on his mother's back like a cowboy on a horse. It's a pretty great system from the baby's point of view. Slowly, carefully, a young gorilla begins to venture farther away from the safety of his mother's arms. He learns the skills he will need as an adult how to make a nest of branches, weave them tightly or they'll fall apart in the middle of the night, how to beat your chest, cup your palms to amplify the sound or how to go vining from tree to tree, don't let go. How to be kind, be strong, be loyal. Growing up gorilla is just like any other kind of growing up. You make mistakes, you play, you learn, you do it all over again. It was, for a while, a perfect life. This chapter has one sentence in it, so I'm gonna share it with you because I think it's gonna help us to forecast what we might be finding out next. It's called The End. It says, one day, a still day, when the hot air hummed, the humans came the very suspenseful part of the story. I'm predicting that we're going to find out more about uh, how Ivan was taken from the jungle, from the rainforest, and ended up where he is now. Don't forget to make your reflections, friends. I'll be back.